This is the Historical Museum of the D.R. Barker Library. Today is December 11, 2001. Michael and Christine Derby Quadrado are making the individual recording. And today we have with us... Melvin W. Schmidt. And your birth date, Mel? March 2nd, 1925. And your current address? 3274 Turner Road, Jamestown. New York. Uh, war in which you served? World War II. And your branch of service? I was in the United States Army. And your highest rank? PFC. What is PFC? Private First Class. Oh. For those of us who may not know. The reason I made PFC was all men overseas 18 months all night we got it. Oh. <laughs> so I made it the hard way. <laughs> So, Mel, how did you, what, what age were you, how did you get involved in World War II? Well, 17 years I was in my senior year of high school in East Aurora, New York. At that, in them days, the war was uh, going pretty strong over in Japan and that, or the islands. And they were taking us, our, our seniors, right out of class, to put them in the army, wherever they wanted to go. And a lot of them never had a chance to finish high school. I'm glad to see now that they're giving the diplomas away to some of the guys. But I, the day before I turned 18, I went down to the Buffalo Enlistment Group and re enlisted in the United States Army. And they swore me in, they gave me all my shots, and they went, and I just put on my application that I went to finish high school. And I never heard anything until my last month of high school. And then we graduated from high school on the 24th of June. And the 29th of June, was on, I was in Fort Dix, New Jersey. So I didn't have too much time. For Fort Dix, New Jersey, all we did there was knock beetles into a jar of water for two weeks until they sent us down to Fort Bragg, North Carolina for basic training, artillery, artillery training. In, in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, we, we trained like every other soldier does. All the cow tanks and all the drill parades and all the physical you go through the firing range and all that kind of stuff. We would maneuvers. But one thing I remember about Fort Bragg, North Carolina was well, one thing I remember a sergeant we had, his name was Sergeant Cheatham. He was our instructor. He was a brutal man. And a lot of Myself, along with a lot of all my other buddies, we all hated him. But then, when we got overseas, we loved him because he taught us a lot of stuff. But it's just an average American boy going into the service. One thing I remember about Fort Bragg, North Carolina, I was probably the chaplain's office more I was than anyplace else because I loved to visit him. I was brought up in a home where there was no drinks, no whiskey, no wine, no beer. So I didn't, didn't miss that stuff. On weekends when we had a chance to go, to weekend pass or something like that, to go to Fort Bragg, uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina, most of my friends all went out drinking. But I didn't. I found refuge in the Lutheran Service Center in the town, where I met fine people, nice guys and their wives, and, and just a nice place to be. We slept on the couches, and we had a real nice weekend there. But while I was there, I have a story that I, I talk talk about my the cross I had and what the cross means to me, which is another story completely. But I'll just the, the first part of it I'll tell you because I use the army for that part. I got a I got a hold of a piece of leather and embroidered it all the way around with lacing. Inside that I made up made a plastic cross, cut it out, put that on there on top of another plastic and mounted that. And in that arm and across in the leg I had my mother and dad's picture, my brother's picture who was with joined the Navy, his wife and my first nephew. And it just fit in my field jacket pocket. Just perfect size. I carried that all through my army career you might say. It it went overseas with me. Well, okay, then we, then we went from there to uh, Christmas, Christmas of 1940, 
three of them are still in the States. And we're up at Fort Dix, North New Jersey again, waiting to go to the Port of Embarkation. But they gave us a pass in New York, in uh, Washington. And walking around Washington, I was just still homesick like everybody else was. We met three very nice, charming uh, Air Force girls. We wound up all at the church together at midnight, took them to their bus stop, wished them goodbye, and they invited us out to their air, air camp the next day for, for, for Christmas dinner. We went out and we had a very nice time. But then we went up, we were reported back to Dixon, that they, they sent us over to uh, Camp Shanks, New Jersey, which was the port of embarkation. And that was, we sailed out of New York Harbor around January 2nd of 1944. We walked up to the gangplank of the ship, they handed me two cards of cigarettes, a shaving kit, and writing material. So all of us guys were up on deck, it was a little Liberty ship going over, it was just a little transport. It was a merchant ship made into a, a troop ship, and we all started smoking. So the government got me smoking to begin with. So we went overseas to get, it took us 15 days going over in a boat, in a convoy. And I was sick a good 12 of them days. Where I wouldn't care if they throw me over the side if they wanted to, but it was, that's how rough it was, going in a convoy back and forth. We landed in Bristol, uh, I think it was Bristol, England. And I'll never forget where it was in the evening we pulled in, it was dark, but there was a sentry walking up and down the docks. And, you know, and we asked him, what's new? What's happening? You know, we don't know, but we know we know what's going on. He said, oh, not the new church was back. Well, we didn't know he was gone, but <laughs> it was just a humor part of it. They sent us, they took us by train down to Cardiff, South Wales. They put us in our, we went over as replacements. So they put us in a replacement depot there, a camp, right in, this, right in the town. We had it made there, really. Uh, I could sneak through the fence any time we wanted to. Get fish and chips or whatever else we wanted to do. But they took us for training up in... Uh, no, you ever saw that movie, How Green Was My Valley? It was made in, 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 in Wales. Welsh movie about the coal mines. But we trained up in that area. And they, they trained us as replacements because we didn't know what we were going to be when we went to go to... I trained as an artillery mechanic in Boya Bang. But when you once go to France and you're a replacement, you can wind up anything. You wind up the infantry, engineers, whatever. Whatever they need you, somebody is gone, they'll, they'll replace you. So the invasion came June 6th. We sailed on June 8th. We got on a boat in, 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 in Plymouth, England. We're going over, over and then it was an English troop ship. And as closer we got to France, the more we heard. I never saw so many ships, so many planes in the sky, and, and flares and everything else that was, was being strafing and bombing. But as we approached the coast, the English sailors threw their nets over the side, both sides of the boat, front and aft. And that was for us to crawl down into the little landing bars in the bottom. He looked down his little landing bars from up that ship. It looked like a little matchbox in the, in the sea. But we started down. You once get halfway down, you know there's no turning back. It's just go. And we got on our landing bars, and as we went for all the guys to get down, we went down about five, ten at a time. And this thing is moving all the time. The boat's moving, the landing bars are moving. The guys that down first hold up. You know, the rope away from the ship so you don't get banged up in, the, in your legs and stuff. One of our guys got tangled up in the, in the ladder and he wound up upside down with the rope in between his legs. His gun was dangling off his shoulder and everything else. And the English sailors crawled, worked down the net to help him get straightened out, but they thought they were going to help him all the way down. They let go, he let go, and he came right over backwards. Well, on this landing bars, he had some two by fours across. Where they must throw canvas over once in a while. Maybe when they slept on it themselves, I don't know. But he hit one of those braces and that broke his fall. And we caught him and got him straightened out. Uh, and now, now the adrenaline is flowing pretty hard. We hear the noise, we know what's going on, we, we, we don't know nothing about war, we're green. I'll never wait 
my whole, well, at any time, my whole life since Boy Scout camp. But anyway, we started on the beach. Now you got your rifle on your shoulder, you got your nap, your pack on your back, you got your trenching tool, you got your mess kit, you got your drinking water, you got your, 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 your grenades, you got a gas mask, you're pretty well weighted down. You start in. Now my biggest fear was I can't swim. If this landing virus does not get in fire enough or gets on a reef or something, I'm going to drown. But by luck, we went in, they put the landing barge down, the orders are go. It was water up to my chest. That's what the first, first, the cross, first got his baptism under fire, you might say. Okay, that, that cross and I went through, through Normandy, through the hedgerows. Why I wasn't hit, I don't know. For some reason, I'm still here today, but anyway, it's not for me to say. Only one guy knows that he's upstairs. But anyway, for six, for the first three months of that war, we slept in a foxhole every night. If you're in a holy position, you get to sleep two nights in it. If you're in a holy position, you do done, done one every day. We not only did our thing in our own foxholes, but we also got together and we dug. It was probably in my in my wearer group. I was just, I was just, uh, assigned to a wearing group, which which uh, laid, which operated the forward switchboard, we had to learn that all over again, just a little field switchboard, and we were laid the wires from there to our forward observers, because that's what the big thing was, the communications with the, from there they laid back wire back to the batteries, and that was your main communication. They'd rather use that than the radio, because the radio they couldn't zero in on. So anyway, uh, those foxholes, is, is just, I got pictures of it in my book. It's a hole in the ground about uh, six foot long and about uh, three foot deep. And as long as you're below the ground level, if a shell hit anywhere near you, if it didn't knock you unconscious, the sh fragments would fall over the top of you. So that's it felt pretty safe in there. Surprisingly, you could curl up underneath the helmet at night or when we had a chance to sleep, because we didn't have definite hours. We were, we were on the go 24 hours a day. We had one blanket for as long as it lasted, and one change of clothes. Now, when we went into France, I would say for the first three months, we had no change of clothes. What you had on your feet, you wore. If I told you that I didn't take my shoes off for a month, would you believe me? People don't believe me. Well, it, it was that way. You peeled your socks off. But we slept in holes, and we also dug every night. We dug two main holes for two guards. It was probably 12 men in my battalion right there. And we were accountable to each other. We were operating the switchboard and for laying the wire and then fixing the wire if it was shot up or. Uh, they had a lot of what they call weasel. They're jeeps with tracks on them. They used them for amphibious and all that stuff, but they brought them in the shore, into the hedgerows. And the tanks and the, and the, the guns and the shrapnel and the, and the, the 88s that come in all tore up our, our communication lines. Now, when these are tore up, it was up for us guys, whoever was on duty for that particular time, that two hours or three hours. You pick up the line from the switchboard and you start out with it in your hand. Now, this could be at night. And you better know the password, or you're not going to make it back. But we had a different password every night. We also had crickers. It was a thing for the invasion. The paratroopers had them. If you were challenged, you could quit your cricker, and they knew you were American. But then that, the Germans got out of that too after a while. So they had, then we got passwords every night. So you pick up the line, and you won't go on the top of the ground with that line. And if you got challenged by the infantry boys or by the whoever was out in post guards or on guard duty around their own battalions, you had to have the password and have it fast. But if when we go to it, if all of a sudden we hit an end where there was no more there, the line ended, you know you found the break or one of them. So then you search around, you know it can't be too far away, but you try to find the other end of that. If not, you splice on it, run a new line, but try, you try to splice them, splice them together. 
And I, I, now you knew when it was still good or not, you had a field phone on your back. A little crank up field phone that you see on MASH. And you'd clip your wires into the, in your wires, clips into the wires, and you'd bring your little field phone. If the switchboard answered, you know you had them. If the front, if the observer answered, you know you had them. So then you can tie them both together and you know, go back. Many times the, the shells would come in and you jive for cover and you come back and find out it was cut again. It was, it was always that, 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 that fear. But I say the weasels and the, and the, and the tracks of the tanks and everything used to cut these things up because they couldn't see them. There was little, little fine wire like a thermostat wire they used. From the switchboards back to the other, the main switchboard they used a more of a, a heavier wire. Cable took more abuse. So that's the way we went, went through France. I remember, oh, my first duty, and now it is a replacement. We went to a rendezvous area, we come out the beach, went to a rendezvous area, they said, dig in for a night, we started to dig. And I had a buddy with me, he was a, a teacher in Tallahassee, Florida, Cecil Rollins. He's gone now. But Cecil was about 10 years older than me, so he was like a dad for the back of his an older brother. And we said, well, we didn't know what's wrong with that. The, the flares are falling, the, 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 they're dropping some bombs. And we said, well, we're going to, we took a hedgerow, we're going to clean it out. Because hedgerows were like this, and the other side the same way. And the hedgerow took up about an acre of land. My members, my bottom of land serves me right. But each hedgerow was probably ordered by the acre of land. And so we started clearing out this hedgerow. We were hacking away at the brush and, and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden he it was a, a flurry that they dropped the Germans dropped a flare. And just lit up that countryside like it was day later. And all of a sudden he was out of scream and he out, out, out of the hedgerow. And I said, You ain't gonna leave me here, so I ran right after him. So when we, we got to another spot, he, 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 he didn't say that. We just dug a hole, period. We dug a hole and got into it. Two man fox hole. We went back the next day to that particular spot right there. And what we saw was, what he saw was, just over the top of the hedgerow was a dead German. His hand was off, half his head was blown away. And he just looked at you like that. It's not to scare anybody. Now, our outfit didn't pick, up, pick us up till that afternoon, the next day, or late morning. So they come along with a jeep and a trailer, and they gave us a job of picking up the dead people, the, the dead soldiers, German and American. Now you couldn't pick them up by their hands because they're already two or three days old, or, or their feet. You had to pick them up by their field jacket, cuffs, and their pants legs. Put them on a stretcher, roll them into the jeep. We stacked them up like cordwood. And I'll never forget that as long as I live. It's, 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 it's something you just don't get out of your mind. And, and, well, and then from there on in, all the way across France, that's all you saw. You saw aid stations with guys laying out there like cordwood, lined up, that never made it. You see the, You got to a town or something like that, go through the town, you'd find, you walk over to dead Germans that are right by the machine guns and when they got them or a shell got them. But some of our guys too. And it was, it was hard to, it was hard to start. Back to, go back to Normandy. When I went into Normandy, the paratroopers went first. God bless them guys. Boy, they did a heck of a job. And they went through hell. And the reason I say that because I got a story coming up about that. But anyway, the airborne boys in the gliders, sometimes an airplane pulled two and three gliders over to France. They released them after the airborne airplanes went in. Now they had to land them things. When they once got released, they didn't know the territory or anything else. They had their maps in that book. When you once, it's just like anything else, you once start down in a glider, there's no turning back. There's, you're going to go down. Well, the Germans were very smart. In every hedgerow, they planted tree stumps, maybe every 20 feet. They could not land a glider without busting it up. 
We've seen gliders with uh, all broken pieces. Some of the guys never got out of them. They never got out of them. The ones that did were fortunate. But in the gliders, they also carry small ammunition, guns, little, little 25 howitzers, 50 howitzers, mortars, and all that kind of stuff. There was a supply of two for them. But they were fighting and fighting men also. What brings me to a story, oh, oh by the way, parachutes, you saw nothing. Parachutes were taken in trees. In fact, over in Pierre's, Pierre's, one of the towns we went through, they still, to this day, there's a parachute hanging from a church steeple that they maintain there as a memorial with a dummy hanging on the end. But this was a parachute hanging on there and they shot him up there. But they would leave it up there as a memorial. I got, I got pictures of that. Postcards, just look, look some. A friend of mine said it to me. Where was I now? Okay, as we... Okay, the story about the paratroopers. I was laying aware one day, and three German soldiers come out the hedgerow and gave themselves up to me. I was all by myself. And I said, what I, you know, what am I going to do with these guys? So I, I started marching them back to the rear. I had my job to do my and leave it bank. Couldn't trust these guys, so I... I started walking them back. Well, four paratroopers saw me. They come out and said, we'll take them back for you. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but it's, it's been on my mind for a long time. So they took them, and as they turned the hedgerow, I was working again, went back to my job, and I saw them. I know them guys never got back there. But, and it can't, this is war. I feel responsible for them guys because I didn't take them all the way back, but what am I going to do with them? I trust my other soldier friends too, they were all, were all buddies. But they went through a hell of a lot. What they saw in the first day would not match everything we ever seen probably in all the time we were over there. I had 11 months combat to me. So anyway, I thought, I, 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 I know in my mind I never got back, but that's that's over with. I, I hated the Germans too. I, 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 I call them all Krauts and Bosch and all that kind of stuff, but I, I hated them with a passion also. But one of the reasons, to go back, one of the reasons I enlisted in the service was that Hitler was out of hand. Poland, Germany, Czechoslovakia, France, then he's going to go England. Who knows? Next thing would be the United States. And I didn't want my mother and dad have anything to do with this war. Now they got a war in their own country now with the bomb and where the towers. But I didn't want that to happen to my parents. But anyway, that's why, that's why uh, I enlisted. And by the way, I'm going back with you. I hope you don't mind. Okay. In my, in my uh, senior year of high school, I played in the band for four years. But I was asked to play in the New York State Army Guard Band, 65th Regiment, in Buffalo. So I did. A couple of us went down, we enlisted in the regiment of the New York State Army Guard Band, and we played in the band there. We played for their sham battles and their, their retreat parades and all that kind of stuff. They gave me a discharge for that when I enlisted in the Army. So I have that discharge also. Back to France. There's quite a few the battles that, that sticks in your mind. One was that we call Hill 122. It was a good size, well, we call it Hill 22, it was a good size uh, elevation. All, all, all trees and mud, it was about as muddy that time of year. Our F3 boys would take the hill, and counterattack and lose it, take it, lose it, take it, lose it. Finally, they brought up enough air start because it was raining so bad they couldn't get the airplanes up there, but probably without enough artillery that they took the hill. And that was a beautiful observation point. That's why they could tell everything we were doing. And I'll never forget that because it was so muddy, you were not up to your knees. And that's like trying to play wires and all that stuff. Like that. Another place was called the Filet France, was a Filet Gap. The Filet Gap was all these guys when they closed in Cherbourg and that were guys that were, France were all down the area here on the coast. You had the, 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 the Canadians, the English, 
Juno and we'll have a good day with a pizza, but you don't have pizza for us and you don't have pizza for us in some other one. So they, these up here closed off the guys in Fairburn because they wanted that port to bring supplies into and troops into. So all them Germans from soldiers from Cherbourg, when they saw the German troops, saw they were being cut off, they made a dash to get back to their own lines. So we had guys coming up from Italy that way too, but that was quite a ways along. But anyway, our, our mission was, our, I was with the 9th Division. Our mission along with, with quite a few other divisions, 1st and 2nd, all the divisions, along with the the Canadian soldiers, their divisions, and their and the British, was to cut that thing off, what they thought they called the gap. There was one stretch of land there where they had a chance to go through, but we cut them off. They, was, they closed the gap and cut them off. And they wouldn't give up. So they just brought airplanes over for a day and a half and just peppered the heck out of them. Our artillery just land based them. It wasn't nothing to fire a thousand shells a day in the artillery in our group battalion. And they demolished it. They, they, there, was, there, there was a lot of horse drawn wagons and, and cannons and, and munition wagons. There was a lot of horse drawn because they, they were kind of concerned with gas too. They were like, out of it. But anyway, it, 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 it was a terrible sight. Nothing but Dead soldiers, dead horses, you name it. There was nothing alive in that camp. And when they didn't get a chance to surrender, they were lucky. So it's something you don't forget. You forget that stuff. Because the stench, the smell, lingers in your nostrils for a long time. Okay, we went through France, went through Reims. We were, we were south of south of Paris in Reims, France, when the troops went through Paris, so we didn't see any of that. But then we then we're, then we now we're getting into in the country in farmyards. Where, where do you want to go to sleep? If we were in a position where we we, we didn't have to dig a foxhole, we got into a barn. If the town was empty. We got into a hayloft in a barn. If the town was empty, we went to the basements. Uh, any place you can get out of the elements and, and, and try to get some sleep, because we pulled guard duty every single night. You pulled your two hours guard duty, we all like everybody else did. Okay, we got got to Verdun. It was raining very bad, and we're getting ready to assault the Moselle River. It was a rainy season, and I got caught sleeping in the rain. And, I developed a very bad case of pneumonia. So my boys, my guys carried me over to an aid station. I was put in a bee wagon, we call an ambulance, and taken back to a field hospital, which was a tent hospital. And from, I was there for three days, penicillin shots every three hours to try to get the fever down. Well, they finally put us in meat wagons again, and took us, ambulance, took us out to an airstrip Commando planes that were made right here in Buffalo, in New York. There were troop transports and, uh, and hospital ships. They put us on there and they started us back towards Cherbourg. We were supposed to go back to Cherbourg. That's, that's a nice long way from the front line and we were looking forward to it. But the weather was so bad, rain, they grounded us in Paris. Put us on meat wagons again, took us to a hospital the next morning, put us back on a uh, meat wagons again, back on a hospital ship. We were all in stretchers, and they took us back to Cherbourg. So back in, this is it for time in France. Back in Cherbourg, I was there about two weeks. This is a month and a half I was gone from the outfit. Probably saved my life, I'll tell you why then. But they put us on what they call 40 and 8 boxcars, French trains. 40 and 8 meant 40 men or 8 horses. They threw a little hay in there on the floor for you, and that was your bed for two days while you started up towards the front. We got outside of Paris again near Reims, and we went to a nice villa there, but now the troops are up still in Verdun area. It's quite a ways, and nice, we had tents there, and we had to get us all new rifles, new equipment, 
and we had to go out to the rifle range to zero in our rifles. Well, on the way back it started to rain real heavy, and I, it got me, I got soaked again. Went back to my tent, I laid right on, we had laid right on the floor, we had, all we had was a couple blankets, we had no cots or nothing else, and the rain was running underneath the tent. And I guess I was wheezing pretty bad by 2 o'clock in the morning, and then guys, I didn't go to supper or nothing that night. The guys carried me over to the aid station, and we got the doctor out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, and he put me in the meat wagon and sent me back to a hospital in Paris for another two weeks. And that probably saved my life. Also, by the way, back in France, normally for six, for three months, all we had to eat was K-rations. That's a box of goodies, like a Cracker Jack box. Little candies, when they had ham and eggs or, or uh, minced, whatever something it was, we don't even know what it was. Uh, corned beef hash. He had a chocolate bar that take like, tasted like x flax so that was the reason for it. He had a couple of dry cookies, which are called Melba Toast nowadays, little small ones. Uh, and, and a pack with five cigarettes in it. So they kept us smoking all the time we were there, morning, noon, and night. Okay, once when I got, towards, towards the end, back in France, one of my family got sea rashes, which was nice stuff. That was a nice can of hash or something like you could heat it up if you had a chance, or just eat it cold. So that was good eating. And the rest of the food we scrounged from the, the fire money. We used to sleep in what, and to get getting towards the fall now, we looked for better places to sleep. So the firemen, most of them had what they call potato bunkers out in the field. And potato bunker is dug out of the ground, logs over the top, like an arch, grass, uh, dirt, and grass, or whatever you want to call it. Hey, whatever. Trap door. And that was, that was a nice haven. We used to get in there, maybe five guys in one of these places. We had a little patrol stove, which we could, once the door was down, we sealed it up good, and nobody could see the light in the patrol stove. And we had enough potatoes there, cook up a little water, potatoes, we had a nice potato soup, put, put a little, put a little billion cube in there, and that was good eating. That was, that was, that was the cream of the crop. So that was the way we survived. Then, I say, well, then I went back to the hospital. In a 48, uh, 48 car ride back up to the front. But I finally got back to my outfit. In them days, we were all worried because that's when the bell of the bulge broke loose from Belgium. And they were taking Air Corps guys and all, guys, all these guys, sort of went in the infantry up in Belgium. So my buddy and I said, if we don't, if we don't get back to our outfit, we're going to go AWOL, we're going to go find our outfit because we knew the guys. And, well, when I got, we, I got back to my outfit, they finally got me, sent me back to my outfit day before Christmas of 1945. And they were in a holding position, still in this, since I left, they already made a crossing on the Moselle River. The Germans blew all the dams. I and my buddies drowned in that river from a, from a boat who tried to lay wire across in the barge. If I and my buddies drowned, I would say, we're there when I got back. And some new guys to get acquainted with again. But that's, that's war, you, you pass it off and it, you saw you see was death anyway where where it is, so you just you just shrug your shoulders and keep going. So Christmas dinner was nice. We we, we were in a farmhouse. Tom was evacuated. I had a guy in an outfit named Desper. He's from Kentucky. Little hillbilly. And he says, Oh come on, we weren't supposed to kill chickens and stuff, but he says, get some tape from some pillowcases, which so I should have had to do it. So he took it out of the barn there we Grab the chicken around the head, spin him around until the head comes off. And then he would skin them. He had a way of skinning them chickens. It was all the left was the meat. So we found a frying pan, we got some wire, and we had fried chicken. Play a little poker. If you want to hand the poker, you got a piece of fried chicken and the schnapps. <laughs> that was our Christmas Eve. The day after Christmas, they loaded us up on our weapons carriers and our Jeeps and headed for Belgium to relieve the troops. Best on. Coldest ride I ever had in my life. We got no protection here at the top of our vehicle. But we went. It was, it was quite a ride. We got to Belgium, it was snow. Well, it was snow when we left Verdun, but in yeah, fact, it was just more snow up in, up in, up in uh, Belgium. 
And we were lucky enough that we stopped the Germans and pushed them back. And the, the sights you see up there, how they butchered our guys. The men are still frozen in their trenches, in their holes, their, whatever you want to call it, frozen to death. We lost more guys in Belgium from the trench foot, freezing on the feet and the hands, than they did by actual more casualties as far as being shot. The mole and all that kind of stuff. Well, we got through that. And by the time we got to, 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 to through the Siegfried line, for first we, we crossed, went through the Magellan line. Uh, my memory's a little bit buffalo. But then we, the Magellan line was the French line. And then, then, then we, we, we crossed the Moselle River again. Whatever is a river from there on, with the Moselle, the Herb, the, 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 the Daniel, the uh, Mannheim, uh, Bonds, uh, anyway, the Rhine, we had to cross it. We crossed it all on pontoon boats. Pontoon, they put them in and we crossed it. So we got up as far as the Rhine River. And there were so many troops waiting to cross the Rhine. The bridges were all blown, blown out. They had to wait for the engineers to get the bridges across. Every time they get a craft way across, the planes would go over and pile them and they'd lose it. Finally, they brought up so much anti-aircraft that uh, they couldn't, play, couldn't, couldn't fly through it. It was impossible for a plane to fly through that aircraft at a low altitude and do accurate bombing. So they got the bridge across. So we were in a hold, we were in a position that night on this side of the uh, Rhine River, and we found the wine cellar. Of course, you know what you do with a white cellar. I had wound up with two bottles of champagne in my jacket, and, and all the other guys too. Too, we got up in a hay loft on a hay barn, and we're doing pretty good. I made up for the night drinking part of my early days, and uh, I had to go outside for to do a little job, and I went out, and I don't remember. I, I, I must have fell asleep. The front town out there, but next day we're, we're ready to go across the Rhine. So good thing the guys got me up. I was the only one. So we started across the Rhine on the pontoon bridge, and the, Europe, the Germans go over real high altitude, and they drop what they call anti-personnel mini bombs. All this whistling, you can hear this stuff. It seemed hit the water, but we got across. We got across. And then from, from, from Germany and Aachen, I can't remember all the towns, Metz, all these towns we went through. It was it was fighting. But if we ever on a convoy one time, the first time I ever saw General Patton in my life, I never wanted to see him again. He'd come down the road for a week. Our convoy, for some reason, stopped. And when your convoy stopped, your anti-aircraft guns immediately pull off into the field and set up for strafing or bombing. Well, he come down the road with his two pistols and his ivory holding pistols at his side, standing up in his jeep just like you pitch him in the TV. Cursing away and swearing, get these, I won't say it. Things wagging, get these trucks moving, get the hell going. You think this is a picnic and all this kind of stuff. Look, that's the first and last time I ever saw him. So that's my memory of General George Pat. He was a good soldier. I don't think he cared much about his men. All he wanted to do was win battles, no matter what the, what the price of manpower was. But maybe that's what a war is. You've got to sacrifice to win your objective. objective. I don't know. I wasn't an officer, so I can't tell you. Okay, we, we, where we go? We go across France now, or in Germany. The Siegfried Line, that was something else. It's all what they call dragon teeth. I got pictures of that, too. Dragon teeth are things sticking out of the ground about this high, and they're just like a tooth. Every four feet or three feet, whatever it was. And the entrance ways were all steel bars and stuff. In other words, tanks couldn't get across the without knocking tracks off and stuff. So they had a blast away through them, through them, them things. The engineers did that. And the engineer boys, boy, they're just like the infantry boys. They, when they had a job to do, they did it. And my hat's off to all of them. I slew them all. But then we, then we slept in pillboxes. We, we slept in their German pillboxes that night because uh, it was a good place to be. <laughs> You get concrete maybe four feet thick, and uh, I, I, I sleep there. I would stay there for the rest of the war. But 
I had to go back to the rear to get some wire out of the service battery. And then I, I went back and coming back up, I had a load of wire on the back of the weapons carrier. I was all alone. And there was shells all over the road. That's from where the, the, the Germans got their trucks got tipped over and all that kind of stuff. And I had four flats at one time. So I knew there was wire laying on the road that we had laid, so I tapped my fuel phone into that and I got this got back to the service battery when I set a truck up with four new tires and fixed me right there. Get back to my outfit. If a man in Germany was hit and move, hit and move, sometimes you got to recount it, that can't push back, but it mostly hit and move. One night we, we were moving so fast, we passed a whole German Panzer division holed up in the woods that nobody knew about. That's how fast we were moving at that time. Well, that night they tried to get back to all our headquarters, the artillery, and all mind you, all the generals and the colonels set up a camp in that wooded area on the edge of that woods, not knowing this. Well, they come out that night, the Germans trying to get back to all lines, and they all hell broke loose. Our anti-aircraft anti guns were firing direct fire on tanks, and they, they stopped them. They mopped them up. So that's different things that happened as you went through Germany. Now we got towards uh, we, we crossed the, in the, over into Czechoslovakia, crossed the Danube River, crossed over into Czechoslovakia. And the war was just about the end. And there was, you know, the, we, we pushed the Germans back up into the hills of Czechoslovakia. And the war, they wanted to give up, the war had come to an end. They got their, their notice to it, somehow they got their message. War was in it, they give up, surrender. And I got pictures of that in my book also, of this German army coming in to surrender. We were in the town, and they committed this town, all lined up like soldiers, old men, young men, mostly old and young. And they, they were just, we couldn't handle it, it was so damn. And our officers told them that, set their off, laid all their ammunition in their off, in their guns down in the field, stack them up, and told them to take off. Take off for home. They had to walk across their home. They, they walked across Germany back to their houses, because we, we, we couldn't transform them. And the, their own German people took them in and took care of them. The war was over. In fact, that's, that's when President Roosevelt died, too. And he said all the troops were mourning him. Well, we didn't care. We, didn't, we were having a good time. We were dancing in the street. The Czechoslovakian people got their customs on, they got their, their, their musical instruments on their attics, and they had band concerts in the town, and we're dancing in the street, and so on and so forth. They were giving us all kinds of stuff to eat. We had it made. But after two days, the very next day, the Russians joined us, joined us in that town. They pulled us right out, gave the town to them. Pulled us out, they pulled us back to a town called Machshuti, Germany. It's a little country town, but it was a big steel factory. It wasn't touched. And a big displaced person camp there. By the way, our division, our division liberated some of the Jewish concentration camps too, along the way. But there was a there was a DP camp there. That's displaced persons from the Polish and the Czechoslovak and stuff. People that they used for manpower in the, in the uh, factory, men and women. They all slept in one big room, one big one with big barracks. But there was maybe 20 of them there, 20 barracks like that. Well, okay, we got back to this town called Machuti. And us, us older guys all look for the good jobs now. You know, uh, they, by the way, it didn't take them long to set up a, our, our commander got rid of his troops, it was time for him to go home. And they set up a, uh, a garrison, we had a big schoolhouse that we were building in, a town schoolhouse. Nice sleeping for beds. We had beds and everything else, that was great. But then, then us guys were all looking for the good jobs, us old guys. Old guys, 20 years old, 23 years old, old guys. But compared to the new recruits coming up. First we got up as a switchboard operator and stuff like that, handling all the calls coming in and stuff like that. But then, 
they, they needed my, my personal good friend of mine, which I'll tell you about a little later, Rocky Strauss, Werner Strauss, from New York City, a Jewish boy. And we were together, we trained together, overseas together, went to France together, at the same battalion, the same war outfit, and come home together. That's how close we were. And that's a tie that you don't break. Well, he, 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 got, he could talk real fluent German, because he was from Germany, originally from he was a young kid, probably going, but he could talk to the Well, they gave him a Jeep. They told him to pick a driver. And we had to go down to this place person to camp every day and interrogate these people. Their names, where they're from, and so on, whatever. I forget what was on these things. So we had it made. We had a, we had a good deal. So when that ran out, they needed a bugler for retreat parades. Now the guy's really getting chicken. And he wants to put on a retreat parade to impress the people in the town. You know what a retreat parade is? This is this one. All your soldiers line up and they march around the parade ground and salutes and all this kind of stuff. Inspection. It's it's a re, it's it's a review of the troops by your officers. Well, anyway, but this was every night. So they the bugle. That's my ball. So and, and I always learned never to volunteer for anything. But this this is one thing I did. I volunteered. Uh, I used to play the bugle in the Boy Scouts. They said, Yeah, I can play the bugle. So they gave me a trumpet and they sent me down in the woods for about five days on a bugle book and I learned all the calls and I was a bugler. They had it made. I was the first one in the John Lane in the morning. The first one in the noon lunch hour call, call the troops out, call them back out for a work detail, call them back in, call them back out, and retreat parade every night at six o'clock. That's where you do the colors and all that kind of stuff. And then at night when I had to play the taps, I didn't have to cover I didn't have to worry about bed check. I just put Wherever I was, I come back up to the corner, do the taps on the corner, went back where I was before, and I didn't pay. It's one of the gravy jobs in the army. So I can't say I didn't have one of those. Then it was time to come home after four months of occupation. And during that four months, the first month especially, every morning they get us, many morning they get us up at five o'clock in the morning, turn us out, and get on trucks and go to some town maybe 20 miles, maybe 30 miles, maybe 40 miles. And we pull a raid on that town, looking for SS troopers. The town burgermeister used to come out. And in them days, he didn't fall me nothing. They, they used to go from corner to corner and shout out the, the orders for the day. How much time do I have? Mm, okay. 47 minutes. Okay. So they shout out the orders for the day. And the people had to turn in all their cameras, their guns, binoculars, turn them all in. Well, I gave those guys a chance to pick up camera once in a while or a pair of binoculars. Or I already had a Uber, which I confiscated. That's another story I can tell you about. So, uh, there was anything to line all the people up in the town and we go through their houses. It's, it's, it sounds a little barbaric, but it had to be done. And we were soldiers. We weren't all the goody goody boys. You know, we, we went through a war. And, and who do you, you know? Well, anyway. Then, go back to the war, back in the war. A woman called me in the house one day. It was in, was it in France. I was roadblocking. That's when your troops moved, you used to put roadblocks out. And there was two of us in the corner, and she kept coming. Pulling my shirt to come in. So I finally went in. I shouldn't have done it, I had my gun with me and everything else. I was ready for anything. Because the troops were moving fast. And she took me up in the attic. She's all crying. Her father had committed suicide. He hung himself. Well, the only thing I could do was cut the rope and get him down and leave him late. I didn't have time to fool him out. I got out of there. I told the, the uh, medics about it. And another time, I went into a house. Why I went in, I don't know. Probably search, it was searching the house, really. And I went to open up this bedroom door, and there's two people laying in bed. And I, they were dead. But anyway, on this chair, real nice chair, this was an SS officer's house. It was his uniform, dress uniform, all hung up real neatly on this chair, his dress sword. His Luger, 
his hats, his whole outfit was laying there. And he apparently he took his liver and he apparently he shot him, his girlfriend or his wife, whatever it was, and shot himself in the head. And I picked up that movie and I got the hell out of there. So, uh, you see some things that you don't see every day. That's things that, I never used to be able to talk about this. I'll tell you how that came about. Anyway, I got sent back home on what they call now. We went over on a Liberty ship. It was the same kind of ship now they call it a Victory ship. A Victory ship is where they, they took the, 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 the cargo holes of a freighter and they sealed them over with canvas and wood and that. And then down below that, in, in, in the holes, he had bunks maybe five high. And that's where you slept. And that, you had a little area. That was your, that was your home for come forth, 14 days coming back. So we had a big storm, I had to ride the storm out. And I, I wouldn't care if I fell overboard, I wouldn't care, I was so sick. But anyway, if the guy on top was sick, you got sick too. Because you couldn't get up, you couldn't. Yeah, was, you stood up, I mean, if you got to, go to, the, to the mess place where they ate, you stood up at tables and, and pipes. You didn't sit down, you stood there and you eat out of your can. And the boat would roll this way and you'd go down this way, roll back and bring your can away back this way. Hard boiled eggs and boiled ham for 14 days. Well, we pulled into Camp Miles Stanish in Boston, in Massachusetts. And from there they took us to, uh, now, that was nice. The band come out of the barge next to the boat and played all the American songs and girls were singing and they welcomed us back home, which is more than they did for the Vietnam boys. So they got us back, back home and us, we put us on trains. From there, and they took us down to Fort Dix, down to New Jersey, out of discharge, December 5th of 1945. Now, I don't have three years I was in the service. The only time I got home was a week and a half traveling time from Fort Dix, from Fort Bragg to Fort Dix. That gave me about four days home. For them days, there were no airplanes. We rode all the trains. That's the only time I saw my family in all the three years. Now I'm going home. What's what's home? I mean, I'm ashamed to say, at this particular point in my life, home didn't mean much anymore. I mean, just another place to go. But after I got home, so my mother and dad was all a different story. Okay, my first day home, I set off for the corner drugstore, which is a soda fountain where I used to work when I was a young guy, and. I sat down and then Lefty was the owner and he was a nice guy. He helped me a lot. And Lefty was procuring a pretty young waitress going to wait on us. And I says, uh, hey Lefty, who's the girl? He says, well, Louise Newberger. I said, oh, well, introduce me, will you? So he introduced us. And I was back there every day. <laughs> I said, this is my girl. So she was still in her high school. She was still in her last year of high school. She was queen of the prom. She was a beautiful girl. She still is. And I see her graduate. And she got a job. Buffalo, she didn't go to college. She got a job in Buffalo working for me in Trust Bank. And we went together three years. And I wouldn't trade that courtship for all the years of my life. And we behaved ourselves more than people do nowadays. So, if she finally asked me to marry her. Uh, we got married June 28th, May 20th of 1949. And we've been married now 52 years, two and a half years. My wife has given me two beautiful children, son Tom, and daughter Linda. They in turn give me 11 beautiful grandchildren. Jeremy and I got Goes with Vicki, Kelly, Emily, Micah, Jamie, Jill, and I think I'm off. Vicki. And over here, my son gave me Matthew, Michael, Katie, Lindsay, and Chrissy. And they're beautiful kids. Beautiful. They no children there. They're, they're they all they were all valedictorian so far in their schools in Jamestown and Maple Grove. So I'm very proud of them. You know, a lot to be thankful for. But then, oh, by the way, I started my own business. After working eight years for a guy doing sheet metal work, I started my own business, heating and air conditioning. And I 
I finished 42 years of that from five years ago. And after five years, I went to work at Cloudy Markets in Jamestown, bagging groceries until I had my open heart surgery. Then I never get up. But to get back to the, to the, what was I talking about? The kids. Oh, I had one chance to go back to, well, I've been back to Germany now probably uh, 14 times. My wife's been there about 18, 19 times. Every time I thought I had a baby, we went back there, she went back there. And uh, she, she married a German. I had a tough time with that at first. But anyway, over a period of time, he healed, healed, time healed with all wounds. And, uh, in fact, one of my, uh, my son-in-law set me up on a trip back to the town that I was stationed in after the war. I got pictures of my book, standing in the same spot, same corner, same church steps, same building that we were building in, there and 35 years later. So it was, it was a nice trip for me. Met some same people. But anyway, uh, my, my, my ambition is, yet yeah, I'm still too old yet, maybe, that somebody will drive me back to Utah Beach someday if I'm over there. We're going to go this spring. But what will happen, I don't know, with my health and stuff. You know, it would just be, I'd love to go back to the cemetery and see the, the monuments. I, I correspond with a young French lad now. He's 22 years old now. He's a policeman. He goes back every June 6th on D-Day and puts flowers on different graves that he picks out. Because he believes what, the, what we did for, the, for his country was amazing. And he sent me all the postcards, all the, all the monuments over there. He sent me sand from Utah Beach, sand from Omaha Beach. It's all in my book. And it's nice, nice to have. Now we go, now where were we? We go back to, uh, my daughter, okay, she lives in Germany. We've been there many times. Oh, one of the stories, three years ago I was over there. This is how things change. I went to visit the, I, I even sang with a German singing club, believe it or not, here in this country for 50 years. My father, the reason why that was, my father-in-law was from Germany, his wife. They came over many years ago. So my, well, my wife is German descent, my two sisters. But my father-in-law, Patrick, told me, you want to marry my daughter, you go sing it. <laughs> So I said, well, she's worth it, I'll marry her. I've been singing. I was singing for 50 years. I was one of the little singers when I left there five years ago. <coughs> so, uh, I was singing at my daughter's wedding in Germany. I had the honor to do the, sing the Lord's Prayer. And a lot of our singing club was over on a tour at the time. And that was quite a thrill for me to sing at my daughter's wedding in Germany, at her wedding. And that's another story. It would take another hour to tell you that story. That's another story. Okay, let's go back over here. Come back home here. I I was already in a VFW post in West Seneca, New York. Uh, I was in that post until we moved down here to Jamestown. And I transferred to post 557. It's always centered at Venus Point. And I would have to remember that I write the newsletter for them every, every month, every other month. And I enjoy doing that because it gives me a chance to get things out of my system. But I, I, the, the war never bothered me mentally until seven years ago. Seven eight years ago. When everything came on the radio to celebrate the 50th anniversary of D Day. And for some reason, now I'm retired. I got too much time on my hand to think. And the memories all start coming back. And a lot, then I start allowing myself to read a little bit and stuff like that. And it, it come back on me. And then I get to, the, to the, the guilt point in my life where, why was I here? Why am I saved and my buddies are over there? I only got one buddy left. That's it. Did I tell you about my buddy Rocky? And, and no, you said you were going to tell us about him. Warner is in, and he goes now in New Jersey. He's the guy we went together, trained together, what else he's here. I called him last Sunday. He's a Jewish boy. This is something we've been doing every year. I called him last Sunday and I wished him Happy Hanukkah. He in turn wished me Happy Holidays for Christmas. We always have a bond between us. 
Nobody could ever break. It's a mind that combat soldiers develop. But I respect his religion, he respects mine. And that's what this country is all about. Now I get back, okay, then it started bothering me real, real bad. I, I wrote an article one time, but it was in a post journal, it's in my book, about Omaha Beach, Utah Beach. I would like to go back and visit. It was just an article that just jumped up in my head. It was about a half a page long. And the VA counselor in, in uh, Jamestown read it. She called me up, she called me in. She says, I'm going to put you in for a compensation. I never, never knew it was available. Fine. And this is five years, four years ago. Well, I wound up, I went to, to, uh, psych, to a psychologist that the, that the, the VA appointed for me, Santa Maria Donna, you know. And we get together every, every, month, every Tuesday. Myself, I'm the only one or two guy here, and of course the six Vietnam boys get together. And we just talk. But then, a year ago, right, right November, I was, they sent me to Veterans Hospital in Batavia for a PSTD program, which is Post Traumatic Stress Disorder. I spent 28 days there with four guys from World War II and about eight guys from Vietnam. And we sit around every day around a table or in a room and just talk, trying to help each other. After the second day, my Vietnam boys come over to me and they pointed me to prison by the way of the group, <laughs> which I was honored. They come, they come up to me and they says, no, no, we didn't realize that you guys went through the same crap we went through. I said, well, why do you think that? A war is a war. Dying is dying, killing is killing, and living is living. It's all the same. Maybe we went together different different ways. You guys had helicopters, we had trucks. Tanks. That's the difference, right? But the, the human element is still there. But they come over to we had never had sign every day to the session. I said, you know what, this is wrong. I said, I want to have for World War II. So they went over to Bobby with so it's the one I got my case on. So that made me feel better. But we, even now today, we still get together. Uh, not them same guys, but the group I met in, 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 in Jamestown. We get together every every week for a session. And it really helps. Today was great. Today was a great session. Because we all get things in our mind once in a while. We can, with, with them guys, we can talk about it. If I could sit, I'm talking with you right now because this is what you're doing. But it's hard to talk with strangers. I know what you're doing, so I know. So, so. But then last Sunday also, well, we go oh, Sunday. I have a witnessing that I do and a testimony that I give to my Lord and what the cross means to me. And then I also do that, and I sing a song. Well, as you probably know, what the, what I'm going to talk about is the cross that I carry with me. And I don't talk to them in my talk, I don't tell them about me, I tell them where this cross went. And how tattered it got. And, and withered. In fact, it's hanging right now in my daughter's house, in her dining room in Germany, as a medal of her father. So, I had a little replica I made up and showed it to people in the church. And it, was, it, was, it, was just, it was just one of the greatest things I ever did. Because I talk about that, then I talk about two years ago, this time of year, I was in Erie Hospital with open heart surgery. And when I was, can I tell you the story? It had a two by two ceiling with tiles. And in that ceiling, I counted, I think it was 40 tiles in the area I was in. My, when I come out of the hospital, okay. I, I, went, went, I was working at work two days before Thanksgiving. And senior citizen day, turkeys were heavy. I still think they freeze them up with water and make them weight heavier, but I shouldn't say that. But anyway, I had a tough time wrapping them, bagging them, and getting them into the shopping carts for the people. 
And one of my coworkers saw I was having very much trouble. Well, that morning, I'm getting ahead of myself. That morning, it was a regular morning, like any other morning, I say my prayers in the morning, I get up. Like for breakfast, so my daughter, granddaughter's German birthday, birthday was coming up in Germany. I went downstairs to wrap up a present for her in the box, tape it all up and so on. From time up the stairs, I couldn't get up the stairs. My wife had been down carrying the package up, and I managed to get up the stairs. I had such pain in my shoulders, pressure across my cheek, my chest. And being an ex fire chief, I should know the symptoms. But this never happens to you. So I got up the stairs, I sat down for my breakfast. I didn't stay down very long. But I made a boot. I bluffed my way out of the house that morning for my wife's sake. I bluffed my way out. Took the package down to the mailbox in Gary, the post office. And I went to work at Quality Markison from that animal in Jamestown. And I say after the first half an hour I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't handle it. They called my doctor on the phone, they knew where my doctor was, he said, bring him right in. They thought they, the boss sent a guy, a girl home to pick up my wife, because I had the car. Brought her down, she got the car, they put me in it, and I went to the, to the doctor's office. When I got to the doctor's office, he immediately gave me an EKG, which called cardiogram. Next thing I know, I'm in a wheelchair, and he's walking next to me with his stuff, and the nurse is pushing me. Then if, and there's a ramp between his office and the, the hospital. Then I knew, if he's walking with me, the doctor, and the nurse is behind me, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Finally hit me with what was happening. I wound up in, in the emergency, in extensive care for four days. They got me settled down pretty good. And they gave me a nuclear stress test. And that next morning, or that next afternoon, I was on my way to Erie Hospital, Hammond. Heart Hospital, broken heart surgery. I didn't know what I was going to do yet, but they, the first day we got there, they, they took all the veins and see which veins are good they could use, and, and they gave me an angiogram. And the bad news came back, I had 190 percent blockage. So it's a good thing things worked out the way I wouldn't be here today. But anyway, come time for the operation, that was, on, no, Tuesday, that was Monday. Tuesday morning, they took me down for emergency operation. And they took me down on a, on a tent bed and at the table and they laid me over in the operating table. And the young lad comes up to me and says, I'm going to be your anesthetic. Anesthetic put me to sleep. We'll put you to sleep. And I said, oh, okay. Have you looked at my side? He says, no. He picks up the, my, my sheet there. This thing had exploded or something. It was all black and blue. All the way around for a good foot. He says, he called the, the surgeon come in then. He called Dr. Lee right over. He said, Dr. Can you look at this? He says, Take him upstairs, I can't operate on him. Okay, I can't thin his blood out enough. Because he said he got, he's going to try a new method to operate on my heart without turning it off. So, okay. Do you remember the doctor's name? Pardon? Do you remember the doctor's name? Dr. Lee. <laughs> in heaven. So it take me back upstairs. Now I got three days later and think and pray. But the, God, the Lord works in strange ways. It gave my daughter, I'm sure about this, enough time for her to get her family all situated with friends. Her five children, now, her husband. She's got his own business there. It gave her the chance to get an emergency flight to come back to America to be with her mother and her, her brother and her, her sister in law. So when I come out of the operation, I didn't know she was coming. I didn't know she was going to be there. It was a complete surprise to me. The only operation where I could gradually know who was around me, there she was standing with my, my wife and my son and my daughter. I'll never forget it. I was so doped up with morphine and Demerol, whatever you had to give you. I had tubes all over me, on my mouth, on my nose. I couldn't talk. I just lay there. When they were gone, I just lay there and stared at that ceiling. I counted 40 ceiling tiles in that room, to the best of my ability to count. But out of that four ceiling tiles, I counted six tiles this way and three this way. Formed a well, perfect crosser, if I might. And I just clung to it. Because I always believed in my life, I had to do my share of suffering, as the Lord did for us when He hung on that cross for our sins. I clung to that cross and I prayed. I said, Lord, there's got to be some reason you got me through. Through war, 
I had, I had a full life. I lived my life fully. We traveled a little bit one I met a beautiful woman, married her, I had two wonderful kids, eleven great grandchildren, wonderful grandchildren. Not great grandchildren, but grandchildren. I had my own business for forty two years. Retired. I saw my fiftieth wedding anniversary at that time, I was fifty, I was only fifty two now. I had this all these opportunities to do this. My buddies never had this chance. Why? Why am I a spirit? I had the pleasure of serving as fire chief, chaplain, and president of the Union Fire Company down on West Seneca. I had the pleasure of serving out of District Boy Scouts of America and the Buffalo Council of District Chairman. I had this honor of serving as president of West Seneca Lions Club, which is a very active club. I served as president of the West Seneca Chamber of Commerce and also as president of the Colden Chamber of Commerce after I moved out to Colden, New York. I served on an orphan home board already in the West Seneca. I served on our church council in Colden and president of the church council for quite a few years. I said, Lord, I'm tired. I'm ready to go home. Please take me home. I pray that you take me home. Well, second day come, I'm still there. Third day come, I'm still there. The fourth day they moved me up to phase two of what do you call it? Recovery room. I said, well, or apparently they don't want me yet. So you must have something in mind for me to do. I'll tell you what, Mark. You give me my voice back and some strength. I'll do my testimony and my witnessing to you. And I'll sing your songs. I mean, before this, before I went in, I told you earlier about, I used to stutter and by singing I got over the stuttering after the war. I sang almost every domination church in Western New York, weddings. Now it's funerals, all my friends are dying. But anyway, I sang a lot of different, I sang at Bison by the, by the Field in Buffalo, National Anthem, I sang at Memorial Auditorium in Buffalo, National Anthem. And so for many civic functions, national anthem, which is a beautiful song for me. But anyway, I said, Lord, I'm, I'm pretty okay. I said, you got something in mind for me to do yet. Must be the reason I'm still here after all this. So it took two years until this this last three months I got my voice back where I can sing again. And I sing my, my favorite song, which I adopted now from all after I do my testimony. You want me to sing it? Sure. Okay, it goes like this. <clears throat> Laden with a heavy burden, need the lot of suffering and pain. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I'm no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, yes. He touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Now I've met this blessed Savior, since He touched and made me whole. I will never cease to trace, praise Him, and I'll shout it, while eternity rolls, for he touched me, yes, he touched me, and all the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, now I know he touched me and made me whole. And I always give a little challenge, if I do this in a church, I give a challenge to the people of God's love for them and how they can get this. All you have to do is, now if you'd love to have this feeling of Jesus' special love just for you, then raise your voice towards heaven, and I know that he'll come to you, and he will touch you. Yes, he will touch you, and all the joy will flood your soul. Something will happen. But then you'll know he touched you 
and made you whole. That's the way I witness. That's about the end of my story. Right. You have a beautiful voice. Thank you. I have a couple of questions for sure. you. Um, one is, I was wondering if you would talk to us about the flag behind you. When the war ended, we were, was this flag we picked up during the war. In fact, I got, I got two more banners holding like this that are 10 foot long. They said they're never using them on their balconies and stuff. How we, how we have to get those was every time we, like, the, if we found something we wanted to send home, it was we, like a sword or something, I'd wrap it up in a, in a German flag, put it in a shell casing, and send it home. Well, the shell casing always got home, and the flags always got home, but the stuff was taken out from inside. And this flag was, we were all sitting around in the field in Czechoslovakia, and the orders come down to turn in our German weapons for safekeeping there until we get time to go home. I think one of the officers were after them, but we, we, we really loved him. So we had, we had a constantly them all up, and, Pack them away. I had a like, beautiful German Luger and a weather holster, a homework holster, ammunition, and everything. And while we're sitting around there in that field that day, I had this flag and all my buddies signed it where they're from. And that was a nice little medal for me. And up until maybe 10 years ago, being so busy with everything else you're doing, all no, until 12 years ago, I had my old office down and my business is tough. And I start picking out names in towns, and I call information. And I, get, I got, got quite a few of them. A lot of them died since then. Mm -hmm. My buddy from Tallahassee, that was a, he was a principal school down there, he died. Uh, but I did get in contact. I would say that there's only two of us, three of us left on the whole thing that are not here anymore, that I know of. So that was a nice, nice way for me to get in touch with them guys. And we, then that's why we call each other, you know. Uh, then I used to go to army reunions, uh, and my office was Texas, Oklahoma. Here, mm -hmm. T.O. That's Texas and Oklahoma. I always know as a tough armories. Uh, they they they, uh, they have reunions. They have a reunion every year, but it got so I couldn't afford to go anymore. But when I was in business, I couldn't go. But I had the honor of singing the national anthem at all their banquets on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. At a memorial service on Sunday morning, I was saying a nice song, and that was very inspiring for me. So I got only started by singing, and uh, that's how I carry on. Uh, that's that's how that flag. Is. Any other questions? I was wondering if you could show us your photo uh, oh. when you were younger in uniform. This is when I was young. You can hold it up so the cameraman can focus. I got pictures of the combat outfit and all that kind of stuff. But, okay. Oh, here that interesting. Oh, yeah, the V letter. Yeah, yeah. A lot of people never heard of Korea, Vietnam, Gulf. Don't know what a V mail is. A V mail is something that our government came up with when we were all in over in Germany, in France and Germany, and England. And then what it was. It was a piece of paper this size, and it says V-mail on it. And you wrote your, your message to your mother and dad or your sweetheart or one door right in there. And then during the war, the searchers would come with a little thick knife and cut out the different things that you want. It was the name of a town or something, you know, in case it fall any hands. Then you fold it up, and that was given to the mail court. And they would take this. Photograph that, as you've seen in my book there, and it would turn out this size. Go home with a little envelope, and you're, that's, what you're, that's what your correspondence was. That's another thing. When I went to France, I received no mail. And my folks never heard from me, or I heard from them for a good three months. Hmm. When I did get a mail, I had two sacks of mail. So, but anyway, now they take the note. When I was in a hospital in France, it was before Christmas, so I used to draw in high school. So I, I drew a picture of a soldier and Merry Christmas and my mother and dad from a hospital somewhere in France. But I have all kinds of email in there that I've sent to my different relatives and stuff that they give me back. Hmm. But this is my pride and joy. You're very artistic. And, and what it said was, 
just for the censor stamp here, but from your son to all the Americans, Happy New Year. Dear mother and dad, somewhere in France, November 1944. Peace on earth, the little men, you'll have a devoted son. Oh, I have two more questions for you. One is, what is a pillbox? You were talking about the German pillbox. Pillbox is in a Siegfried line, and also along the coast of France, where they they built. It was it was it was a it was a one room affair, not very big, but well for books and stuff, enough for their guns and their cannons. They had portholes or holes to open up. They could shoot out over to the Siegfried line and imagine line. One pillbox covered the other pillbox, so they could help each other. But between our engineers and all this kind of stuff and bombing, we, we got them out of there. It was, was not an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. But that's a pillbox. Okay. It would probably be the same thing you'd call on the coast of France when you see these movies and D-Day and stuff, how they, them cannons come out of these concrete bunkers. Okay. They were, they were, that would call them pillboxes also. That's what a pillbox is. Um, did you want to mention um, which camps that you helped liberate? Oh boy, I can't remember the name of them. I think it's okay. We, we, one name I do, I wasn't there personally, but Oswich was one of them. Mm -hmm. But there was some more, I can't tell you the names anymore. That's okay. But one thing we did find, you probably heard about the mines, the gold mines in, in Germany. Mm -hmm. We we lived, we 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 found those. I didn't find them. My division found them. It was all photos as soon as they did find them. It was a mines, coal mines, I think it was. It was gold mines, I don't know. It was mines in the ground. Where they had stored all their art treasures that they stole from all over uh, Czechoslovakia, France, uh, and gold. Of course it was put off on this right away. Mm -hmm. I would like to hold a gold bar if I could, but <laughs> Uh, and then the, the, another thing we we we, we got home we we we, we, we got was a come to a mountain one day and, and we, we slept in this after it was taken. They had a big railroad car, big railroad gun, huge. They could fire miles. And we we finally destroyed that. But just to roll this out, shoot, roll it back in, nobody knew where the hell it came from. I'm sorry. Where the heck were where the heck it came from? Uh, anything else? Um, I was wondering, do you want to tell us which medals you were awarded? Yeah, they're on the bottom there. Uh, I was given a... I can't remember what I have on the hat here. Well, that's a picture of me when I was younger. The service. <laughs> Okay, uh, European Theater of Operations with five battle stars for Normandy with the Arrowhead. Northern France, the Rhineland, Ardennes, Alsace, and Central Europe. A good conduct medal, World War II Victory Medal, the Army of Occupation Germany Medal. I received this for the last 10 years of New York State Conspicuous Service Cross, and, and my division received the French Jubilee, or also received the French Jubilee Medal for the 50th anniversary of D-Day, but my 90th Infantry Division was, was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation and a French Cross de Guerre with power. I'm very proud of that. Is there any comments you'd like to give to the youth of tomorrow? Well, I, right now I, I'm thinking about, about young troops in, 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 in uh, Af Af Afghanistan, if I say it right there. Mm -hmm. And I just can't help it. They're going through a war like they did in Vietnam now when it comes to the cave stuff. For Youth of Tomorrow, I wrote it, this article I wrote here is, is about the price of freedom as through the eyes of a Normandy soldier. And I tell them about why they got the freedom they have today. Have to read the article. But, and I hope other people read it. And it seems to me, what I observe in the last
three months since the bombing, September 11th. Mm -hmm. And up there you're listed too. I got prayer back in school. You're allowed to say the prayer graduation exercises now, just read this morning paper. There's there's they're sort of breaking down this church and state thing. Uh, I love to see flags in churches. I love to see flags along the, the towns and all our towns where they have the all summer long, especially being this point as a visitor's town. I love to see that. And I think our young people, I don't know if you notice this or not, you're seeing more stories in the newspapers of what they remember now about their grandpas. And, 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 and I, I, I encourage all my veterans friends that are still alive, I write this in my newsletter, to take the time to make a, a, a video cassette audio, or take a paper and a pen or a pencil and sit down on your Sunday afternoons or evenings, you've got a lot of time now, most of us are retired, and write down their experiences. I've heard so many young people come up to me and said, gee, my dad or my, my, my grandpa or never told us anything. And every time one of us dies, the story goes on. And that's why I encourage these guys to do it, whether they will or not. It's got to be in their own personal time and their own time. I myself, I started a book, and I keep adding to it. And I hope I, the tape works out okay. That's, uh, so that's my my journey in life. Why I'm here, only God knows. I was wondering if you would do me a favor that you can decline if you'd like. I'm sorry. I, I was wondering if you would do me a favor. But you're, wel you're welcome to decline if you like. I was wondering if you would end your video by singing the national anthem. <laughs> <coughs> I'd love to do it. Okay. If I get the right key. <coughs> you know, like one thing about when you're singing, like for instance, by the field up, um, up in Buffalo, foot, the, the new baseball diamond. That Buffalo pilot, used to be pilot field, I don't know where it is now. But anyway, when you, when you stand on first base and you sing that national anthem, and it happened to be the days that they have uh, the firemen all there and the parades and the fire and uh, all the flags are on display and, and they bring the helicopters in and the adrenaline is going. But some days like that, you sing the national anthem, you can't listen to the mic, you can't listen to the speakers because they're, they're a couple of seconds behind you. So I just turn my hearing aids off <laughs> and go at it. Now let's see if I get the right key. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars to the peril is fight. O'er the ramparts we watch were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets rang glare. The bombs bursting in air came true to the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Find out if you ever want a standing ovation, sing the national anthem. <laughs> well, it was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your stories with us.